Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's one o'clock on my um, on my computer here, so I think we'll we'll get started. Uh, my name is Norman Regetley. I'm I'm with the Rural Ontario Institute, and uh, I'm just going to provide a little bit of context before I turn it over to uh, Lisa Hernandez, who's uh, our MC for today. And first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Mitch Davidson and Shiv Ruparel from uh, Strategy Corp for um, for participating today and um, actually for their report, The Future of Ontario's Workers, that um, kind of started us off on, on this uh, uh, journey to bring this webinar to you. And I'd like to thank uh, Savannah Myers and Steve Furness from Gray County Economic Development, um, who are gonna provide uh, a bit of the local story, I guess, in terms of how uh, the issues that the paper raises are playing out in their area and how it, it looks in Gray County and what kind of local initiatives they've started as a result. So um, just to introduce Lisel uh, to everyone, Lisel Hernandez is a project manager with the Rural Ontario Institute and she's um, been working with us a number of years that's currently uh, funded on a MITAX, a postdoctoral uh, fellowship. So we're lucky to have her for a year after she completed her PhD in neural development at the University of Guelph. And Elise has been um, focused on labor force issues in rural Ontario while she's been working with us. And um, as she got started, the COVID hit. Uh, so, um, and that really did affect, uh, you know, rural employment. So uh, Elise has been um, curating uh, a section of our website we call Rural Rebound, which is about uh, rural communities and, and rural organizations and government programming that is uh, addressing um, the impacts of COVID uh, and particularly the impacts of COVID on businesses and employment and the economy in, in rural Ontario. And among the things she's been doing is uh, case studies. Uh, she's talked to a couple other counties, uh, Oxford County, um, Perth County about uh, initiatives that they had underway to help their communities respond. So in a way, this is a third in our series of case studies on that because we have Gray County on the line, but future of Ontario workers and the future of Ontario rural workers obviously is not just a COVID related um, issue. There's been some uh, labor force development challenges in, in rural Ontario that pre-existed COVID. COVID um, may provide some opportunities. In fact, with the increased telecommuting, if we can get broadband out here, um, that might, might help address those things. So I'm sure that those issues will come up in the in the conversation. So um, I want to thank you all for participating. I'm going to hand it over to Lisel and she'll uh, be our MC for the rest of the yeah. webinar. Over to you, Lisel. Hi, I'm back, but uh, I keep getting the message that uh, the internet connection is not stable. So if you could stay in the in the meeting, that would be great. You good to get started, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, maybe maybe I'll just take it away, Norman, if that's fine. Um, so I know I know there's a there's a few other people joining, and and that's great. We can have them uh, join as we're going. So uh, you'll notice my my colleague Shiv is currently sharing the screen and uh, and putting up a presentation from us, and so. Uh, if anybody's having any issues seeing that, just let us know in the chat and we'll, we'll uh, try to rectify it. But Shiv, um, if you just want to go to the, uh, to the view um, show presentation, then uh, we, can, we can go ahead and chat a little bit about um, our white paper. So this will be the first of sort of two presentations and then I think Gray County is going to, um, uh, Savannah is going to have a bit of a conversation about some specific on the ground realities. But we uh, we have the Strategy Corp Institute of Public Policy and Economy. So by way of introduction, uh, my name is Mitch Davidson. I'm from uh, rural Ontario. I have a couple of posters in the background there from Ormidante, born and raised in between Barry and Aurelia. And uh, before coming to Strategy Corps, I was actually the uh, head of policy for Premier Ford and, and the PC opposition party before that. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of experience in provincial politics and left to, uh, to start this um, market-based think tank at Strategy Corp where we try to write white papers that are both um, 
politically salient and, and policy heavy. And so uh, we came ac across a lot of the Rural Ontario Institute's work when we were doing a paper for Colleges Ontario about the future of workers. And uh, Shiv, if you want to um, go to the next slide. Uh, the main point here, when we, were, we sat down to do a paper with, with Colleges Ontario, uh, which is the association that represents the province's 24 publicly funded colleges. We, we originally talked to them about doing a report on the future of work, as you probably have heard about this term before. It's a very sexy term in sort of the thought leadership circles. And, and we wanted to take it from a different angle, which was not the future of work itself, not the future of jobs, but what would that mean for actual workers? And so that's where we get the title of the paper is The Future of Ontario's Workers. And while we were doing this work um, and, and doing some research and, and analyzing what automation might mean, um, what, uh, what the advent of technology might mean for people's uh, positions, COVID happened. Uh, and so it, it really did change some things. And all of a sudden we had a bit of an acceleration of a bit of an acceleration of some of the trends that we were experiencing. So uh, by way of introduction, just quickly on this slide, um, Shiv Ruparel, who's a co-author with me, is also on the line and present a few of the slides. And then uh, um, there's some other contributors from the firm who are not on today, but uh, Shiv and I will be doing the presentation. So um, going on to the, the next slide, uh, and we'll stay here for a few minutes, because I just want to explain the context of the paper and why the paper is relevant to, uh, to the Rural Ontario Institute. So we broke down the paper into a few different subsets. Uh, obviously, there's, there's a part about recommendations in the college sector specifically, but part one was more of a, a survey analysis, and hopefully some of you were able to read the paper in advance or, or skim through it. And, and in part one, there's, there's a few different sections that we uh, examined. What was the skills gap looking like beforehand? What, was the, what were the trends that were impacting workers and, and employment in Ontario before COVID hit? Um, what were these opportunities like for workers with differing levels of education and of course, and I think this is the emphasis of the conversation today, what was that conversation like and what were those trends like for the difference between rural and urban Ontario? And so I, I'll tell a, a really brief um, anecdote, which we, we reference in the executive summary of the paper, which is a General Motors facility in, in a town called Janesville, Wisconsin, which is actually where, where Paul Ryan is, is born and raised uh, in the United States. And Janesville lost its General Motors plant uh, in, in the recession in, the in 2008. Uh, is a town of about 60,000 people. And this was by far and away the major employer in town, as you can imagine, similar to like a General Motors in Oshawa or, or a, you know, the Toyota plant in, in Alliston, Honda plant in Alliston, so on and so forth. They lost this General Motors plant and all of a sudden the local community college in, in uh, Janesville, Wisconsin had 2,000 people enroll uh, in its college programming immediately. And so they, they didn't have the capacity to handle this. This is quite an influx of people because all of a sudden they realized the only thing that they had done to that point in their lives or the thing that they'd been trained to do was no longer applicable and they needed a new set of skills. They needed to retrain, to upskill, to do something different. The problem though, with 2000 people enrolling in the college, one was the capacity, governments handed some extra money out to try to help and they were able to provide um, enrollment for all these new students. But all of a sudden, by the time the graduation rolled around two, three years later, they estimated only about half of those students actually stuck through it because they had car payments, childcare, mortgages, utility bills. They couldn't afford to stay out of the workforce for two years, three years, four years to get a new education, to get a degree, to get back in a new position. And they ended up taking jobs that were either out of town where they would move to new, nearby urban centers and leave Janesville permanently, or they take jobs that were underemployment, things like cashiers where there was no real barrier to entry in terms of a skill basis. So. Uh, which were fundamentally lower wages and less benefits than they were taking before, which was not good for the local economy. So we, we said, if automation is going to hit, and, and then eventually COVID-19 as well, but if automation or COVID-19 are going to cause layoffs, are going to cause changes to the way that people work, how do we prepare for that in advance to accommodate the workers' needs, which is the fact that they need to get into the system, get new skills, and get out of the education system quickly in order to, to retrain and, and to, uh, to find new work. So going to, to the next slide, and, and I will turn it over to Shiv here. There's a few graphs that we're going to show um, just explaining sort of the skill shortage and issues that were going on that we evaluated in Ontario before uh, COVID-19, and then we'll, uh, we'll bring it specifically down to, uh, to the rural level and some of the issues impacting rural versus urban Ontario. So turning it over to Shiv. Hi, everybody. My name is Shiv Rubrel, and I work with Mitch at the Strategy Corps Institute of Public Policy and Economy. 
Um, so we're going to show you a few graphs here. So there's a few trends that we're seeing in Ontario's labor market that were evident actually before the pandemic. Um, and that might not seem immediately relevant to the north, uh, sorry, to the to the north south or to the rural urban divide, but are actually quite in, implicated. And one of them, for example, is a skill shortage. Um, so you can see here that in terms of the percent of the total workforce, you look at the number of new job skill requirements versus the labor force skill availability, and you see that that gap is. Uh, widening over time between 2006, based on historical data, and then also projected into 2031. Um, and, and, and essentially, one of the things we find, and we'll show that on later slides, is that that skills gap is even wider in rural Ontario. And when we say rural Ontario, we're referring not only to rural areas of less than 5,000 people, but also non-urban Ontario. So outside of Toronto, Toronto, of Ottawa, outside of major metropolitan cities, and including areas like Barrie. And you see that this gap that gets wider over time is actually double. Um, so it's interesting to say how not only are we facing a skill shortage, but we're also facing it um, in, in a more pronounced way in the, in the rural parts of our province. One of the most troubling things about the Ontario labor workforce trends is our aging workforce. Now, our aging workforce is something that we talk about a lot in Canadian and Ontario public policy. I think this, this graph is quite remarkable in the fact that you see that between 2007 and 2019, Ontario's labor force aged 65 plus grew by 149%. So the rate at which our elderly population is growing is vastly outpacing our youth. By contrast, the age 15 to 24, so our young workers who tend to also be uh, manual workers, especially outside of urban areas, uh, that labor force actually shrunk by close to a percent. So so it's, and, and again, the, the issue that we're facing is that this, this trend is even more pronounced in rural areas. So we, see, we see that as young people are moving into Toronto, into the Golden Horseshoe area, it's dragging up the overall average age of the workforce uh, outside of Toronto, Ottawa, and other major centres. With regards to automation, we see that more and more industries are substituting their employees with automation. But, you know, per what Mitch said, it doesn't necessarily make sense for example, to have the automated uh, serving line at a restaurant versus having somebody bring you your food. What we do see is interesting is we see automation industries that we don't always associate with an automated workforce. And particularly these automated areas are heavily concentrated in uh, the rural workforce. We see things like transportation and warehousing, manufacturing, mining, agricultural, forestry, natural resources. We see that those actually have the highest rates of expected automation. Uh, the adoption or uptake of automation by 2030. Um, so what's very interesting is that, you know, I was reading a report in the Global Mail the other day that looked into the advent of automation and the focus on Toronto. And one of the interesting things that came out of it that we actually saw reflected in our raw data was that the, the rate of automation is going down in urban centers. In urban centers, you have service-based industries agglomerating, whereas it's in the rural or non-urban parts of the province where they're increasingly bringing in machines to replace things that our workers were typically doing. So the, you know, the, this, that's a very interesting takeaway we have from our paper as well. And again, this is a trend that we've been seeing in the decade leading up to COVID. And of course, now with the pandemic, it has been slightly exacerbated. Um, there's a whole element of the paper we discussed that gets into the idea for soft skills. So, you know, when, when you discuss the future of work, the, the focus tends to be on technical skills. And by technical skills, you know, we mean maybe it's computer software, uh, engineering, maybe it's how you use a certain equipment when you're out in the mine. Um, and what we actually see is that the demand for soft skills is going up at the same time as technical skills are being introduced into new sectors. And the, and the reason that we are hearing from employers is that we can teach somebody the technical skills, but what, what really drives home uh, the dollars for us is our customer service and what we call soft skills, or a better term might be essential skills. And, and so we see that the, the share of employers in Ontario specifically that are looking for candidates at a given skill level, they really emphasize things like collaboration, teamwork, communication, in addition to uh, technical skills. Great. Uh Thanks for that, Shavin. So, so it's a lot of information and there's a little bit more here in terms of statistics and figures, but now getting specifically, I want to get specifically into what's happening in rural and urban Ontario. And so um, the, the fact of the matter is, is that before COVID happened, and, and so obviously there's been a bit of a change as a result of, of some demographic changes, people moving out of the cities and those sorts of things. But before COVID, 
the labor force in rural Ontario was, was slowly shrinking. Um, depending on your definition of rural Ontario, you know, there's certain centers like Peterborough and Thunder Bay where the labor force was actually shrinking. Um, in other centers that are of similar size, Barrie, Woodstock, so on and so forth. In a lot of those cases, the, the, um, the labor force may have been growing, but it was growing at a very uh, slow rate. So between 2011 and 2019, for example, the uh, non-urban labor force or non-rural labor force grew by 10.6%. Uh, in rural areas, it actually shrunk by 15 6%. So it's quite a gap. It's quite a contraction of people. Uh, and, and it's generally correlated to the further you go outside of a city, the smaller that labor force becomes. And that shouldn't be much of a surprise as, as many employers uh, tend to, tend to um, head towards urban areas. But the sheer number of jobs created in rural Ontario versus urban Ontario is really striking. So um, this is probably my favorite stat from the paper in terms of uh, bringing this, this to the fore is that there are almost uh, seven or 900,000 jobs created in Ontario between 2008 and 2019. Um, 87% of those were in either Toronto or Ottawa. So, you know, it's just, it's a striking figure. In 2019, uh, the last year before the pandemic, Ontario had banner job growth. Uh, the Premier is out making big, big announcements about the fact that they had some 243,000 net new jobs created. Uh, it was a great year for Ontario on the, on the labor force side. But when you sort of look behind the Komodo and you take a look at those, those actual numbers, 243,000 net new jobs, 244,000 jobs were in the service sector and in the goods producing sector, Ontario actually lost a net 1600 jobs. So those are things like agriculture, mining, a lot of the industries that Shiv already mentioned. So, and they happen to be predominantly found in rural Ontario. So here we have a, a really shrinking labor force and that's actually leading to a masking of the problem because when most people look at employment statistics uh, from a layman's perspective and especially from a political perspective, they look at unemployment rates and unemployment rates have actually gotten better in rural Ontario as a result of a shrinking labor force because unemployment rates only uh, measure people who are actively in the working age of population and looking for work. So if those people are not currently residing in rural Ontario, they don't show up in that data. And so you've got counties like Wellington County and I believe even Gray County had unemployment rates as, as low as 2%, yet at the same time, they're losing high schools or elementary schools or they're having tougher times growing their population and growing their labor force. So we're seeing, you know, a, a really um, sort of negative cocktail in rural Ontario, and it's actually being masked when most people are taking a sort of really uh, high level glance at the numbers. And so how is this going to be affected by automation? One of the things to bring some life to the, the chart that Shiv showed about age, uh, we found, you know, the average age for um, some of the skilled trades in Ontario, and I can imagine it's probably worse in rural Ontario, is striking. For an electrician, it's 37 years old. For a millwright, it's 44 years old. For a mechanic, it's 40 years old. For a hydro line supervisor, it's 45 years of age. And so when you're trying to replace these people or, or find people to, uh, to do that work in the future, um, we're going to be facing such a, a large scale set of retirements with age and a lack of labor force in these areas that can come in and replace those positions. So it's, it's, a really, um, it's a really potentially dangerous trend. Now, all of a sudden, the pandemic happens. Automation goes a little bit faster, but at the same time, people are moving out to rural Ontario. And so we're faced with this unique, and you know, I, I feel bad calling it an opportunity because obviously it's a public health crisis. It's impacting many people's lives, but uh, here's a, a rare opportunity for rural Ontario to capitalize on growth for the first time in a long time. Uh, people are realizing the benefits of coming to a rural municipality. The same thing that I grew up in where you have the space and, and the value of community, um, those things are now the new luxury. It's, it's so um, there's an ability for uh, rural Ontario to backfill those labor force needs, to fill those skilled trades positions, but there's also going to be an increasing demand for services as more people move to rural Ontario and, and it remains to be seen if that's a, a, a trend, a fad or a long-term thing. And so I think we'll, we'll get into that a little bit, but going to, to the, uh, the next slide, Shiv. So just uh, as we get to the sort of the last few slides, we we really took all this information to say, okay, we, we have a good understanding of what's going on. We know that COVID is likely to automate uh, workforces further or to accelerate that automation. What can we do about it? Uh, and what can the province do about it? And so that's where colleges really come in, is how can colleges play a role in training the workforce for the jobs of tomorrow or, or for today, frankly, at this point, uh, and getting prepared. So going to the, to the next slide, in, in part two, the first thing we did was we looked at where are these things? Where are colleges, right? Between their satellite campuses and their main campuses, colleges are in 200 of the province's 444 municipalities. They have a farther reach than many other institutions, especially than uh, other non-government run institutions. 
They're in more municipalities than universities are by far. Um, and, and they have a, a, real, um, a real ability to attract rural students. There's a lot of research that shows that, um, especially when it comes to middle or lower income families, they'll only go to post-secondary education when it's within a driving distance. So roughly about an 80 kilometer radius. If you don't have these campuses in rural municipalities, these students just simply won't go. And we've seen that. Uh, of the 55, there's 55 census subdivisions in the province that have more high school dropouts than graduates. 54 of them happen to be located in rural Ontario. So to give you a sense of that, um, that breakdown, if we don't bring this post-secondary training directly to students in, in their own communities, then the barriers to access get too high. And so we looked at colleges and said, well, they're already in a lot of these communities. They're already uh, available to provide these services. How can we capitalize on that? So going to the next slide. So ultimately, we came up with, with a set of recommendations, and they, they really do focus around embracing micro-credentials, which is just another way of saying short-term programming that's stackable in nature uh, and, and is meant to deliver rapid mastery of skills. So this isn't, this isn't um, sort of elective courses with extracurriculars or all sorts of other um, subject matters. It's simply straight to the topic. So for example, it could be a course in welding, and then there might be another micro-credential in welding at heights or another micro-credential in welding underwater. Uh, those things uh, can then be stacked on each other. So a student can go in, get the first credential and decide that's enough to enter the labor force or continue to specialize. And in each case, they master skills and they're supposed to come in and get tested for their aptitude the moment that they show up so that they're not repeating course programming that they may have already learned in the workforce at some point or repeating programming that, that, they, um, that they've learned in other, other parts of their life. So we really did focus around those, but specifically there's a few uh, recommendations for rural Ontario. And so you'll see five different recommendations on the slide here. The first one is, is what I mentioned, which is, is uh, embracing micro credential programming as a robust framework for the ability for uh, people to retrain and upskill in a rapid manner and to do that at college campuses across the province. So not just at their main campuses, but to make sure that these are done at satellite campuses that are in rural municipalities so that these people can get back into the workforce as quickly as possible if COVID happens to lay them off or if automation happens to lay them off. In another um, interesting use of micro-credentials is, is not actually full layoffs. So when we talk to a lot of employers, you know, they really pressed us to, to be clear that automation is not a dirty word. Um, to them, automation may be a very good thing. It helps them be more efficient. It helps them compete with other companies. It helps them compete with other jurisdictions. And what they want to do is they want to retain their best staff but the role of the job changes. And so I'll use a really interesting anecdote, which, which I thought uh, really drives home the, the situation. So back when the ATM was first invented, and I'm sure a, a lot of us can, can remember, you'd go to the bank and your primary transaction that you would do with a bank teller would be to withdraw cash or deposit cash. Um, then the ATM completely automated that function. Obviously the A stands for automation. Uh, and so the teller now had to reevaluate what its position was because people were not coming into the bank looking to take out cash anymore. Uh, so what they did was they didn't eliminate the bank teller, but they gave the bank teller other roles and other jobs. And so now the bank teller is helping you get mortgage advice, is helping you set up investment accounts like TFSAs or savings or these different types of things. And so that bank teller, in order to be able to do that job effectively, had to become more skilled. And so you're seeing that in automation across the board. And so when the ATM was actually invented for, for a long period of time, for about 20 years, bank branches actually opened at a faster rate than they were beforehand because banks were now more useful to people because they could provide way more services. Now, eventually automation reared its head and we discovered online banking and now bank branches are retracting, which is actually a, a pretty significant problem in rural Ontario. But it just goes to show that automation is not all sort of a one-way street. It can, it can empower people to learn new skills, to take different positions in workplaces. And so micro-credentials are a really interesting option for employers to be able to create specific programming to upgrade their workforce, to become more skilled, to do the new roles that exist with, with uh, automation. And COVID-19, of course, has forced a lot of people who were in uh, particular situations to reevaluate their working lives and, and consider getting into different roles. Um, there's also some other recommendations here about broadband, about some things for, for um, international immigrant students to be able to uh, have additional working hours than the government allows, which makes them uh, even more valuable. We found, for example, which is just a, a classic case of government being out of touch with the on-the-ground realities, is uh, an international student is allowed to work 20 hours a week. But for a shift, uh, a shift worker, those are in eight-hour shifts. 
And so they're not going to redo the way that they run their operations to accommodate for one or two students. If that number was 24 instead of 28 hours, that student could be hired for three shifts a week and would be a much more attractive option. But if they're not, if they're going to be uh, very rigid in that rule and it's only 20 hours, it's two shifts a week. So some of those things were, were really interesting. And then one other one that's particularly pertinent to rural Ontario is that um, a lot of these college campuses, these rural campuses uh, and satellite campuses don't qualify for infrastructure funding from government, uh, be them uh, economic development funds, Northern Ontario Heritage Fund. So uh, another recommendation there to open the tents uh, for some of those investments to, to bring those campuses to the place they need to be to be offering uh, micro-credentials in the community. Um, Shiv to, to the next slide, please. And so, so that really um, does it for the majority of the, uh, the paper. Um, obviously, we're, we look forward to having the panel conversation. I want to leave a lot of time for our colleagues here. And then we can, we can bring out a bit more of the, the conversation, some of the recommendations, and happy to take questions. But I'll leave it there for now and really appreciate everybody for joining on and, and pass it over to, uh, to Savannah. Excellent. Thank you. Let me just share my screen here, make sure I've got it pulled up. Perfect. Can everybody see that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so Steve Furness and I uh, are going to take you through a, an on the ground story of Sydenham campus and the, the developing of what used to be called the Regional Skills Training Trades and Innovation Center, because we needed a word for it, uh, but that was just a mouthful. So it has now become Sydenham campus. So that's what we'll be referring to. So when we first actually read this paper um, from Strategy Corps, we were very happy uh, to see that what we were experiencing on the ground was now captured in a white paper. Uh, because things in rural Ontario are so very different than they are in uh, urban centers. And we need to be a little bit more scrappy here and we need to figure things out in a different way because the, the experiences just aren't the same right across the board. So we have been listening to our employers with Fort Kennedy Market Planning Board. They do an annual employer survey. It's called Employer One. And for three years in a row, this is the chart of what it looked like and our employers were telling us 68% of them that the ability to find qualified workforce was fair to poor. And when you're in economic development, that is not a good number to be hearing. And in a couple of slides, I'm gonna show you where that goes because it, the story doesn't get better. Uh, it gets much worse. But uh, This is what our on the ground experience was like. And in economic development, we are big in Gray County on boots on the ground approach. So we spend a lot of time outside of our offices talking businesses because that's where you get the best understanding. We can't set direction, we can't prepare policy, and we can't take action if we don't understand what's actually happening. So that's why we spend so much time talking to our employers. And this was such a good opportunity uh, to figure this out. So we're going to take you through a little bit of a timeline of what the last couple of years have looked like and uh, talk about where we are today. So it's all about location, location, location. This is uh, an overhead shot of Georgian College and what used to be the Sydenham Community School just down to the left there. And this is the reason why we are where we are today. So if this location hadn't existed and the timing of uh, accommodation review hadn't been at the same time that Georgian was outgrowing its space, I don't think we would have a Sydenham campus. It, it really was uh, just a perfect storm of opportunity and need all coming together in one time. In 2017, we partnered very closely with Georgian College to draft a, a preliminary business case to talk about what does it look like, given what our employers are telling us in terms of their ability to find workforce, knowing that, uh, as Mitch said, we, were, we are one of those communities that hovered around 1.9% unemployment for years. We are, it's not a, a proud number, but we're consistently one of the lowest unemployment regions in the province. And that's really difficult when that means that all of your workforce who can be working and want to be working, they basically are. And so what, what do we do to help our employers? Because they're not stopping their growth. Right across the board, we're seeing growth in our employers. Bruce Power had just announced their major component replacement those two things happening in our region, we are really concerned about what does that mean for our future of our employers, our economy, uh, just everything to do with that quality of life here in Gray County. And that's when the opportunities started to align. So 
but we put together a business case with Georgian College to talk about, you know, what does it mean if the county gets involved? Because normally counties are not involved in training or not involved in uh, that very hands-on side of labor force development where the research group, where the connected, uh, the connectors who are behind the scenes, but we're not that on the ground person, but we realized, you know, we needed to be. And what really has come out of all of this work is that no one can do it alone. We know that we all have our strengths, we all have our weaknesses, and we all have our resources. So by putting them together, that's where we can actually start to take the action. Um, so we joined forces with our school boards because that, it was really important to understand, you know, what our youth are needing and what we're seeing through the school boards, uh, not only to tie to what we're going to do in economic development for our businesses, but also for Georgian College and the future of their uh, development and their growth. So we put together an, uh, an official business case and we submitted it to the ministry in October of 2017 uh, for the community hub program that they had uh, going at that time. And this was the original concept that we put together. Sydney was so attractive to us because it was Georgian College's neighbor. We have a little hole in the fence and that's how we connect uh, to the to campus. So having 10 acres and a 44,000 square foot building that was in actually pretty good condition right beside Georgian College was a big deal. So we wanted to jump on that. So originally we were looking at you know that opportunity for Georgian to be able to expand as they did run out of space. Uh, because we never wanted that to be a barrier. We understand how important our uh, satellite, well, I guess it's not really a satellite campus because it, it really truly is a full-fledged campus here, um, how important that is to our economy and making sure that we support it. So we didn't want them not having space to ever be a cause of concern. Uh, so that is why this original uh, plan does look like this. But understanding also in the innovation side, not trying to be a Mars, not trying to be Communitech, trying to be a rural solution um, to a place where business can come together and put their heads together and where we can pull our resources under one, one roof. So having the Community Futures Development Corporation and our Business Enterprise Center group and a nonprofit of business mentors all come together. That's what that innovation space really was. And the childcare was because that's a major barrier to employment in our region, not having enough childcare. We had an 800 person wait list at this time, and that list also hasn't gotten any better. Uh, so those are all of the, the kind of things happening in the background. So in 2018, we were approved for the that uh, surplus transition initiative, which was the community hub. And what that did was bias the time to really truly figure out what we needed to do while the school board was declaring surplus. So we revised the business plan, um, got everything together. And in October of 2018, we officially became the owners of Sydenham campus. And it couldn't have come at a more important time because there's where our chart went. Our uh, ability of employers to find that qualified workforce has gotten worse year over year. Uh, and our unemployment rate still hovers very, very low. Even right now with COVID, we are still about 5% lower than the province in the unemployment rate. So it's just, it's a consistent uh, experience here in rural Ontario that our workforce is working and one of the things people always asked us well why don't we get our youth to to work more and we said you know what it's not the youth when when four county labor market planning board looked at those numbers over 72 percent of our youth were actually participating in the labor force so that's a really good number and it's much higher than other locations uh, so that wasn't wasn't going to be the only solution we had a lot of employers well we still do employees who are you know, they're not working to the level that they could be working at for exactly the reasons Mitch said. If you want to upskill and you want to get the training that you need or you want to do your trade, you're driving two hours away. That's the closest locations that you could get for many of these skills training. And if you have a family, if you are working full time, it is just not reasonable for yourself or your employer to make that commitment. So people don't get the training that they need and they stay where they are, un underemployed. So those were some of the the big pieces um, that really pushed us towards Sydenham campus. In 2019, um, we updated the business plan again because it is just a constantly revolving door, it seems. Uh, we got busy on renovations. Uh, and one of those things that we actually did really focus on too through that renovation was the broadband. Um, because as Mitch said too, rural Ontario, we really truly do suffer from um, either you have it or you don't. And if you do have it, it's either an excellent connection or it's iffy uh, at best. And that 
that really does impact our ability of our employees and our employers uh, to get to work and to grow their businesses. And now through COVID, we're seeing that even more where a lot of businesses took that pivot, they moved online, but they don't have the opportunity to grow to the level that they wish because they just don't have the connectivity. So what we did at Sydenham was put in the infrastructure to make sure that we had at least one gigabyte uh, connectivity, which doesn't exist in most of rural Ontario, but it does exist in this building. Um, so that was another important piece. 2020, January, we launched, but that didn't happen because COVID, COVID came. So 2020, everything you see here is becoming 2021 plan uh, because we had to shift very quickly. But what we are seeing is that there's actually more demand and more potential on a space like Sydney campus being so close to Georgian College, having the space for people to be able to spread out and the connectivity. Uh, that we think it's going to become even more valuable than we had originally anticipated. And before I hand it over to Steve, we just want to talk a little bit about, you know, while we're doing all this work and while we're writing the business case with Georgian, the other opportunity that came up that really fits well uh, to the paper that was written is about the apprenticeship programs and those opportunities. So what the Dean at Georgian did, Fred Burke Harris, uh, as we were writing these business plans and, and thinking about what was Sydney going to look like, actually put together applications to the ministry for seven new apprenticeship programs and pre-apprenticeship and they were approved for every single one of them. So that was a huge shakeup. Not a lot of colleges were going to that level um, and doing those types of applications saying we desperately need this so we're going to do it. But we now had the information, they had the intel from all of those conversations with the businesses and because we were able to partner together we were able to build that business case not only for us but also for them. And that's why that partnership and that location is so key um, because that's where we see those, those connections really um, taking place. And a lot of people from outside the area took notice when they wondered, you know, what is this, this small campus doing? Uh, going after seven new apprenticeships and, and pre-apprenticeship, but they could not have been more valuable. And starting, some of them have been up and running. Others are just starting uh, to get off the ground now. They were delayed due to COVID also. It's a really exciting time for our region because we have the opportunities here uh, to help the people that we have here. And as we see the growth uh, of folks who are moving out of the urban areas now, especially with COVID, we're going to be ready for them. So even though we're delayed in everything that we've done because of COVID, um, the timing probably could not be better because now we're actually ready to go. We have a building, we have a program, we have the partnerships, everything is there. We don't have to start from scratch. Uh, so that's, that's a good spot to be. So this is what the new concept looks like. Uh, education and training and fabrication, and Steve's going to talk about that specifically. Um, the innovation is still staying because we really do see the, the importance of that area. The community flex space, having a gym is a really good thing to have, uh, especially right now because we can certainly distance. I mean, that capacity before COVID was 700 people in there. So we have lots of room. And then looking at, uh, instead of childcare, looking at clinic space and education space, because that is the wing that is closest uh, to Georgian College. So they are just on the right hand side of that. So I'm going to pass it over to Steve, who is actually sitting in this space as we speak, uh, to talk a little bit more about the partnerships and, and where we are, because this is right now his new office. <laughs> yeah, it's great. <laughs> Don't tell anybody what my office looks like. I have a, I can shoot basketball when I want. So I'm I'm actually in the middle picture, the hot desk room, which is on the right. Actually, we had someone come in and say a business says they need they need to use the broadband. So they came in from Chatsworth, and are using that right now. But uh, I'm I'm in uh, kind of a peak there, but a better picture uh, in the center there. So, you know. The fabrication labs, which we're uh, hoping we get funded, uh, are, are really meant to be uh, training grounds, not necessarily for youth, but for upgrading and for retraining. We want that to be uh, very flexible. You know, we just took a, we just had a roundtable discussion with some uh, construction folks, and they're, you know, when you get on a low unemployment rate, so low, you're having to work with, uh, you know, employees that. And potential employees that may need that extra or a lot of extra help and um, things like 
you know, just learning to do math or learning to have a tape measure, that's not high tech, but you have to be able to do that. And of course, automation is always going to happen, but um, we need to come up with ways to help the employers train and micro train uh, their employees. So the space in the labs, one will be woodworking, one will be metal based, one will be a clean room like 3D printers and the other will be a wet lab. And then we're gonna offer that up to employers uh, to customize some of the training. And part of what we see or what or they see is when they do the recruiting efforts, it's gonna have to be much more of a dance before they take a resume, look at it, have an interview and then let's go. They want to have a much more involved process both from the employee's point of view and from the employer point of view, they have kids have to, or people shifting careers need to understand what the jobs involve. So for example, we have a major employer that does a lot of in installation of windows and doors, and they actually wanna have a set up a room where they actually show people how it's done and whether that as part of the whole evaluation interview process. So we're gonna use Sydney, this campus, however we need to, to help the employers. I mean, a low unemployment rate means uh, business investment will slow down and stop. It will even potentially relocate and move out of the area because you can't function without labor pool. And we're already seeing in some sectors a drastically different business model because they, they can't find the bodies. And so it's a pretty critical thing that between all of us are uh, why employment agencies, the school boards, the Georgian College, or some of our industry associations, the Wood Alliance and Excellence in Manufacturing Consortium, that we keep looking at this and, and, and trying to find a customized approach. You know, and there's other factors we're, we're, we're working on as well, like, like transportation, but this one is a, is a big one. So I, I don't know if there's anything further to add. I think the only thing I would add as well is that when Bruce Power came in and was gonna hire thousands of people, and compete everybody with wages and their skill set. Um, the, the fear we had was that they would basically wipe out uh, certain certain employers in our area. And uh, and so that this whole initiative, the apprenticeship program, Sydenham Campus was about shoring up those other employers uh, and giving them confidence that we can help them uh, find and train the workforce they need. Okay. That's a, a really a key point. Um, that we've tried to talk about all the way through is that it's really it's for all of our business, but especially the businesses who Bruce Power, because Bruce Power has the ability to find the people that they need and they can bring people in. But what about all of the businesses locally and what that impact was going to do to them? Um, so this was certainly a way to, to try and avoid that. And when we talk about automation, I, I liked what you said that, it, you know, it's not, it's not supposed to be a scary word and it's not, it's a very positive thing. And when we talk to a lot of our businesses getting ready for Sydenham and getting ready for the apprenticeships with Georgian, they were saying, you know, they don't anticipate that they're going to have fewer employees. They're just going to have a next level of employee. So a better pay, a better job, uh, because that is where things were going. But it wasn't that they were going to get rid of people. They just know that in the future, they're not going to have the workforce. And that's what we see even in our agriculture communities, which is a huge economy for us here. They have to animate. Uh, automate because they don't have the people so it's just it's a it's a vicious cycle but because we're all working together we're not on top of it but we're not behind it either I think we're in an okay spot to be able to to make moves and and to continue on so I guess that's kind of where we'll leave our presentation I'll stop sharing the screen and then we can just get into a conversation Thank you very much, um, Savannah, Steve, Mitch, and Shiv. Uh, your presentations were very interesting. Um, and as you mentioned, Savannah, we are going to move now to the discussion part of the webinar. And uh, I would like to encourage all the participants to post questions using the chat, and we will incorporate those questions uh, to the discussion. And if uh, you are okay, I will start a discussion with a question from myself, uh, which is what is the value of multi-sectoral collaboration or partnerships uh, in supporting labor force in rural areas? Yeah, I mean, I guess I can go first. I think the, there's, a real, there's a real um, 
the value to, to working together in, in exactly what Savannah was talking about there, which is the diversifying these rural economies, right? So going for a, a Bruce Power is, is, it's the Janesville experience with General Motors, right? It, it is in itself, it's a unicorn and it, it's a great thing to have in your municipality. But if for some reason that was not to continue into the future, if a decision was to be made to shut down those nuclear reactors at some point, all of a sudden uh, you would have a very significant and very different employment picture on your hands. And so any way that you can have these sort of multi sort of sector collaborations with colleges, obviously, as we pointed out, but with the institutions that are in those local areas. So one of the beautiful parts about micro credentials is that you do, the, you can create them in conjunction with employers for the needs they have on the ground. So one of the things we were looking at was, for example, uh, there's a lot of mining companies in Northern Ontario. And one of the big trends in mining is to move to uh, electric vehicles, specifically for their, their heavy duty vehicles. We're talking, um, you know, your, your massive rigs, your massive trucks, those sorts of things. And, and they have a lot of different parts than a regular combustion engine. And they need mechanics. And there's, there's mechanics in, in Timmins, there's mechanics in Sault Ste. Marie, there's mechanics in Sudbury. But there aren't that many mechanics that know how to work these electric vehicle heavy duty equipment parts. And so you could create a specific micro credential to upskill those mechanics to make them now impervious to, uh, to employment changes and to give them a new uh, set of, of um, sort of a new industry almost to, to be a part of. And so working in collaboration between the mining company, the college, and maybe the local uh, auto parts uh, or mechanics, it, it really does help bring that thing to the fore and make sure that you create a more resilient uh, economy. So that, that's kind of the point that I would make on it. And Savannah, I'm not sure, or Steve, mm -hmm. additional yeah, things. Absolutely. And the other side of, you know, we see so much value in having Georgian College right here in our community. Um, and having that post-secondary institution allows us to help so many more sectors than it would without. Um, so when we're looking at micro-credentials or we're looking at programs of post-secondary programs, I mean, we spent a lot of time working with Georgia and to get the trades up and going because that was really a critical piece for our economy. But now we're finding that healthcare is just as critical because of COVID. So again, we're working with Georgia and looking at micro credentials and looking at those stackable options um, to be able to get people in kind of out of the door into long term care and start with those basic credentials that they can then stack towards PSW and to RPN and, and so on without having to go so that we can still have them employed and working here. So that's a, it's a real benefit um, to being able to look at multiple sectors at the same time and know that with enough kind of eyes and ears wrapped around the topic, we're going to be able to make a difference. Uh, so that is that's really key. And I saw a chat pop up about um, uh, the affordable and attainable housing. Absolutely. We, that is something we look at and concern about and talk about and try and figure out on a daily basis. We have task forces now built around that. Um, and we haven't done attraction retention campaigns uh, in the past because we have nowhere for people to go. So even though we're battling this low, low unemployment rate, it's really hard to attract people because we have nowhere to put them. Um, so that's something that we're trying to work with our developers on. Steve can talk a little bit about the community improvement program that we've put together uh, to try and incent that type of development and get it going quicker uh, so that we can continue to grow and, uh, and see our economy continue. Yeah, I mean, I'll jump in on the, on the housing part on both Wade and, and Faye's question because I think it's, it, it really is a good one. It's a perceptive one. Um, you know, the, the odd thing about, or I guess the unfortunate thing about these situations is they're never easy, right? So you're talking about, uh, you need to attract more people to rural Ontario to have a, a proper labor force mix. And then all of a sudden we're, we're faced with a scenario where people are coming to rural Ontario uh, and we're saying, whoa, whoa, housing prices are getting too high or we're losing our, our stock of, of available housing for, for people to move into. And it's going to create a real problem. And I think um, I think it, it, it 100% is there on affordable housing. Um, and it's not just affordable in, in rural Ontario. I think it's just across the board. There's just a lack of supply more generally. And so, uh, you know, we've, we've written some stuff with the Ontario Real Estate Association. We're working on some additional papers on that side of things. That's actually very topical to this question. But anything that, you know, supply, 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 you can do. Because uh, the, the line that I use that, uh, that Faye referenced, I, I saw in a, a local realtor say was space is the new luxury. And and for right now, I, I couldn't agree more. And so, you know, anecdotally, my sister had a vacant piece of land in Orbidante that she had bought a number of years ago, and it's worth two or three times what it was in 2012 or 2013. And 
And as a result of the pandemic, I'm sure it'll, it'll go up even higher. And so um, that, that space is becoming at a premium. And, and when you're trying to attract people to work in these uh, municipalities, you need to have somewhere for them to go. Um, I'll, I'll give one other quick anecdote, which was when I was working, working in opposition uh, for the PC party, MPP Randy Pettipies, who's the, uh, the MPP for Perth Wellington, um, he had a local employer in, in Mitchell, Ontario, and I remember it because it's a great name, Mitchell. I'm, I'm personally a big fan <laughs> of it. But um, they had uh, they they were expanding their manufacturer. They needed uh, something like 50 new employees, and they were running a shuttle every day into Kitchener Waterloo to pick up 50 people, drive them to Mitchell, have them work a shift, and driving them back because there was no housing options in their municipality. And so, how do you fix that in a short term? Houses take a long time to build and. You've got planning permits and approvals. And so there really does need to be a, a concentrated conversation about how to get these, these up and running faster. Because again, you've got a rare opportunity here to capitalize on growth, to bring new income, to bring new demand, new jobs into town. And so, you know, we, we really need to find a way to do that. If we can't do that, we might miss this opportunity. And maybe I can just- a question. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Steph. Well, I was just gonna talk a little bit about, uh, you know, housing and how, you know, you're right, you can't build a house quickly. And so when population shifts uh, in the short term, rental market is where people go in the short term. Our rental market here, uh, it's not measured over the county, but in Owen Sound, it was 7% for a long time and then it was zero virtually. Um, the good thing is that for a long time, the investment numbers made no sense for anyone to build new rental. Getting to the point where that might be happening, which is a good thing because the current rental inventory is very old. One of the things we've done with our community improvement plan and at the county level is offer, uh, we're providing budget to each municipality that has a CIP over five years. And one of the key components of most of the CIPs is incentives to convert existing property and space in the downtown. And even looking at, can we convert large space on the ground floor, which you traditionally not, you don't have housing on, a work, work live space. Because even at the end of this pandemic, the towns and small retail shops are going to really, really come under pressure. So we're hoping that that, you know, is one negative of the pandemic that maybe we start to see some shifting and more people living in our downtown as, as one solution. Um, but it's not, a, it's not an easy solution. And in fact, you're looking for a really good paper municipality of Blue Mountains, which has really uh, experienced this in, uh, in an extreme way where housing prices have gone crazy, the demographics are very much older, and there's nobody there to serve coffee, uh, they really have to figure out how to uh, get the rental market and affordable, attainable housing there. Yeah, I, I, I'll just build on that very quickly. I mean, it's, it's, it's fascinating because you would think of some of these solutions as really urban solutions, things like secondary suites, uh, you know, um, trying to find, you know, basement apartments, that kind of stuff, having incentivizing people to open those up, but they really are a rural solution as well. And to the point about um, uh, rehabilitating or changing um, commercial sites, you know, there's, there's a mall in Sudbury that just finally got its approval, uh, I think last week, and it's converting a number of its storefronts into residential inside the mall, uh, aimed at, at seniors uh, specifically. And that was something they started, I think back in 2016, because they saw that they were getting fewer and fewer people coming into the mall for this sort of, um, you know, typical commercial transaction. And now with COVID, these people have all gone to online shopping. They're using, uh, they're using it for the first time and that barrier has been removed because they've been forced to go there. So converting those out of date commercial uh, or industrial spots into residential or mixed use community spaces is a, a really interesting way. And it's, and it's one that uh, if we can get municipalities and provincial governments to accelerate that sort of planning process to help it happen in earnest, uh, it's, it's a really unique solution to some of the problems that, that, that Wade and Faye have uh, mentioned in the chat. But Lucille, I think you had another question there. Yeah, so we have a question from May that says, where does attraction and retention of newcomers or immigrants come into the picture? So. I can talk a little bit about what we're doing on the ground. Uh, we're very fortunate and uh, to be with Bruce County as well. And we put an application in last year for a local immigration partnership and we were successful in receiving that. So we now have a Grey Bruce local immigration partnership that started up this year and we'll have that for at least three to five years ahead of us. 
And at the same time, the YMCA uh, for our region put in an application and they received uh, the same funding, but for the settlement services. So for the first time, our region will actually have uh, services that are desperately needed for newcomers for the attraction or intention. Because we, again, we know there's a lot of interest in coming to our area. We have excellent partnerships with uh, the Newcomer Center of Peel and their uh, information group. We've brought them several times to our, uh, our job fairs and, and we see the interest is definitely there, but trying to find the housing, trying to find the proper services because we're just, we just haven't been ready. It's, it's something that, you know, we need to understand what does it really take for somebody? We know what it's like to move from one community to another. What happens when you're moving from the GTA here or from a completely different country here? We need to really rethink um, how we attract and retain folks and we need to get the retention side right. Uh, so we have been very focused on the retention capacity before the attraction capacity because if we can't keep people happy and, and you know, get them well housed and part of the community, we shouldn't be attracting because we haven't done our jobs right. Uh, so we're very, very fortunate to have that. And we've got so many amazing community partners um, who are also working towards this. And that's why, you know, having a, a local immigration partnership able to bring those partners to the table so that we can all go in the same direction is really important. Yeah, I, I, the one thing I would say on the, on the immigration side of things is if you think that the housing situation is complicated with two levels of government, uh, welcome to a new level of government being involved in it as well, because you have the municipality who, or the county that may have certain desires about the types of immigrants, skilled immigrants they want to bring in, or, or just a desire to bring in people, period. Then the province has stipulations, and then the federal government is ultimately the one that sets the rules and controls. And we did we did talk a little bit about that with colleges having this unique ability to draw international immigrants and international mm -hmm. students. Um, there's a real high demand for people, uh, especially from overpopulated areas. So I think, you know, Shiv can probably speak to it better than I can, but um, with the research that he did, but from India and China specifically, really looking to come to Ontario and come to Canada to get an education and, and to hopefully find employment. And so um, I think there's, there's a real opportunity there to convert that into uh, full-time residents and convert that into uh, significant contributions to the economy. Shiv, I don't know if you wanted to, to speak a little bit more to that question. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, in, in direct answer to May's question, I don't think the issue is attraction, but it is retention. So, you know, uh, we mentioned in our paper that as of last year, a slim majority of Ontario's colleges um, are now dominated by international students. That means that on average, you have more international students than domestic students. So the issue isn't getting them to come out and study at colleges. The issue is how do they stay? And I think it really does come down to to the visa issue. So Canada is actually the, the only country in the OECD that doesn't have a retention strategy for non-university post-secondary graduates. Um, that's, in any, that's in any single province. And so one of the things that we're looking at is we find that international students upon graduation from a rural college, because they have a very short window in which to find a job under their visa, they run to the GTA because they think they can get a job faster there. So the, so the, so the issue isn't necessarily that there aren't jobs for them in rural Ontario, it's how quickly can they match their skill set with the available opening to stay within those visa deadlines. And then just the, the last point I would make as well is that one of the risks that we see as well is in diverse, uh, diversifying where uh, immigrant students, international students are coming from. So in Ontario specifically, 61% uh, of international students are from India, so a vast majority. Now that doesn't seem to be an issue today, but let's draw, uh, jump over the border to British Columbia, where the vast majority of college students are from China. And now because of the pandemic, the, the amount of Chinese students coming in has been drastically cut and that's dealt a significant blow to funding and resourcing and enrollment in those colleges. So it's, I think in terms of what, you know, the federal government to do, there's lots in terms of what there is for colleges or rural areas to do. I think it's about looking to diversify where their international students come from, looking at some kind of attract attraction program like that. And, and to May's point that was just made in the chat there, which is essentially, and I'll just repeat it for the group, just uh, she writes that she found through working with newcomers is a recognition of their credential seems to be one of the biggest issues. And that's where, you know, a micro credential has a really interesting opportunity to be applicable here because you have to do an aptitude test uh, in order to enroll to see what you do and don't know. So it actually kind of takes that, that barrier of, okay, is this degree that you currently have the same as what we have here? Is it recognized? So on and so forth. It just comes down to a straight aptitude test by which you can match and say, actually, you got 
you know, you have by our standards, 80% of the proper skills you need, and here's the other ones that you need to take in order to fill out that portfolio. So uh, there are definitely lots of issues with foreign credential recognition, but uh, an interesting way is it sort of top up to, to alleviate some of that concern, but it, it doesn't necessarily get them onto Canadian shores. It, it might just be more of a help once they're already here. Um, so I don't, I don't know what the, the end time is for the presentation. I think we have another question. Yeah, so Sorry, so unfortunately, we are running out of time uh, for this webinar. We still have uh, some topics in the chat. Uh, for example, um, low pay, precarious employment, and all those are really interesting topics. Um, you can, uh, for all participants, if you have more questions, you can reach out to me. I'm going to put my email on the chat. And you can also reach out the presenters to keep this discussion. Uh, of course, there is uh, a lot of things and issues to talk about when we when we talk about um, labor. And I was I want to thank you, everybody, the presenters for being here, the participants for um, joining us today. And uh, I also apologize for the internet issues that I was having at the beginning. But I hope uh, this webinar was useful for everybody and. Uh, yeah, let's keep uh, the conversation open. Thank you very much. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Bye.